Wow! I'm no clue. Acceptance. Sushi. I'm so in love with sushi. Chocolate. <laughs> grateful for? I'm grateful for family. Always grateful for family. Love it. God's blessing with a great family. Life, health, and strength. And speaking of strength, thankful for these guns. Obviously for my personal family, and um, but I'm also grateful for my church family. Oh, I'm very thankful for Colombian food then because I'm from Colombia. Yes, that. Arepas. I'm grateful that uh, our daughters are getting older and we're getting our lives back. I... I'm grateful for the inventor of chicken and waffles. What? Thank you, Jesus. Mentorship, provision, food, family, friends, life. Probably my feet, if that's weird. But like, <laughs> that maybe that's probably really weird. But I mean, like, they're like a second set of hands. Okay, yeah. Well, welcome back, everybody. Joining us at all of our different campus locations today and everybody joining us at Church Online. It is good to be with you today to get into the Word of God. Let me ask you that question. What are you thankful for? On this week, a lot of us are thinking about what we're thankful for. What are you thankful for? When you think about the blessings in your life, which ones kind of rise to the top? Is it your family? Your friends, loved ones, is it your health or your home? Maybe it's like the girl in the video, it's your feet. You're just, you know, they are kind of important, I guess. You know, so we're thankful for these things. And, uh, you know, I, I think that a lot of us, uh, we go through seasons where it's sometimes hard to think about what we're thankful for. Maybe you've been there this year. Maybe you've gone through some loss or some pain and you focused more right now on what's missing instead of what you got. You're focused more on your problems than on what God has already provided for in your life. I get it. I've, I've been there myself. It's, it's sometimes like we're the spoiled teenagers, spiritually speaking. You know, have you ever seen a teenager that, like, they got to have everything now and they got to have everything, like, new? Like, I got to get to H&M and get that this outfit. I got I to gotta get some Yeezys, you know. I got to get, you know, Dad, all the other ninth graders have iPhone Xs. You know, come on. I got to get an iPhone X. No, you don't, boy. When I was in ninth grade, do you ever just want to say, when I was in ninth grade, we didn't have cell phones. We had phones mounted to walls with cords that got all tangled and messed up, right? We had smoke signals that we sent to people. That's what we did when I was in ninth. You need to be thankful for what you got. I wonder if God ever fused us that way as teenagers. You got to be thankful. Do you know what I've done for you? Do you know how much I have blessed your life. Are you even aware of what I have done for you? See, I believe that as Christians, when we are posed with that question, what are we thankful for? Man, right at the top, it should be the grace of God. We should be grateful for grace. We should be thankful for what Jesus has done for us. And if Jesus never does anything else for you, he has already done more than enough. If he doesn't answer one more prayer that we pray, he has already given us what we really need. There's a verse of scripture that I have been thinking about for the last, actually last uh, couple of weeks. I've been meditating on, it's good to meditate on scripture, by the way. Not just read it and kind of go through it and move on, but, but you open it up and think about it and write it out and say, Lord, what is it that you want to speak? speak into my spirit about this. And, and one of those verses I've been meditating on is a passage that if you've been around church very long, you may know it. It's Ephesians chapter two. Let me read a few verses here. This is what the Lord says. Paul was writing this to the church at Ephesus and he said, you were once dead because of your failures and your sins. You followed the ways of the present world and its spiritual ruler. And this ruler continues to work in people who refuse to obey God. That was the path you were on. All of us, once lived among these people and followed their desires of corrupt nature and we did what our corrupt desires and thoughts wanted us to do. So because of that nature, because that was inside of us, we deserved God's anger just like everybody else. What Paul's saying is we were heading down a path. There was a course of my life that was going down, heading down this path of, of sin and destruction and disobedience. I was headed somewhere that I didn't even really want to go. And by nature, he said, I deserve God's anger. But look at these next two words. But... God, say that with me, but God, but God had another plan. 
But God said, I'm not gonna let you stay in your mess. I'm gonna step down into the middle of your mess and I'm gonna get this mess all turned around. You better thank God for those two little words in that verse in Ephesians today. But, but God changed your story. But God said, enough. But God said, I'm gonna set you free. I'm gonna let you walk in the light as I am the light. But God said, I'm gonna wipe your past clean and give you a fresh new start. But God, it says there, but God in verse four, who is so rich in mercy. I mean, we can't even begin to understand how rich and abundant in mercy he is for us. Who, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead, because of our sins. He gave us life when he raised Christ up from the dead, and it is only by God's grace that you've been saved. Paul says that a few times in this passage. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him. You're already seated with him in the heavenly realms when you're in Christ Jesus. You are already there today. That's not, this is not future tense, although future tense we will be seated in our spirits, in the heavenly realms, those of us that are in Christ. But right now, no matter what you're walking through, no matter what you're facing today, the scripture declares over you that we are seated not in this world, but we are seated in the heavenlies among Christ Jesus. When we are with Christ, we are walking and living from a place of victory because God did this work in our lives. He seated us in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God, can point to us in all future ages as examples of his incredible wealth of grace and kindness towards us as shown in all that he has done for those of us who are united in Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take any credit for any of this. How cool is that? This is a, what is that word? It's a gift from God. You can't take any credit. This is anything you've done. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things you do on four Saturday serve, Royal Palm. It is not by what we've done so that none of us can boast about it. It is about what Jesus has already done. Now, I'm here to tell you that if there's anything that you need to be thankful for today, if there's anything in you that you need to cultivate an attitude of gratitude for, it is for the immeasurable, unconceivable, irrational grace of God that has been poured out on your life. That's what we need to be constantly reminded of. God, you're so, but God, you, you looked down on our lives and, and you didn't let us stay on the path we were headed. You, you stepped out of the glory and the splendor and the beauty of heaven to step into this world. To get, you know, he didn't just have pity on us. He didn't just look down and go, man, they're a mess. Oh, God, they're a mess. Oh, me, they're a mess. He didn't say that, right? <laughs> he stepped right down into the mess. He stepped right into it to bring us from death to life, out of hopelessness into this eternal hope. And it's by grace that we experience all of it. Pastor Ryan McDermott, who is over our student ministries at all of our campuses, love Pastor Ryan, just preached a great message down at City Nights on grace. And if you were there, if you've never been to City Nights, you ought to give it a go sometime every Sunday night, right in the heart of City Place at the Harriet Himmel Theater, 5.30, 7.30. We're down there. It's a great night of worship and teaching from God's word. And he said this in his message. He said, as soon as you think you've got it, you've missed it. As soon as you think, yeah, yeah, I, I understand grace, Todd. I get, no, 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 no. As soon as you get to that place where you think, yeah, I've heard that scripture before. I I understand what Jesus did for me. The moment you're at that place, you don't have a clue. You, You don't have a clue how unfathomable the grace of God really is. How unmeasurable, how unexplainable that our little minds cannot get around how great God's love is for us. That he, his love is relentless, man. He chases after us. He wants us. He wants you. That's how great his grace is. That while we were still sinners, that's when Christ died for us. When we were so far away, we didn't even know to say we're sorry. We didn't even know there was anything to be sorry about. And it was in that moment that God, man, said, I'm going to send Jesus to pay the penalty. So don't think I got grace. I, I understand it. I'm good. Don't think you don't need to hear another sermon on grace. We need to be constantly reminded of this amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, how wonderful, how marvelous, and my song will ever be the grace and the love of God for me. Man, I wanna be reminded, I've been so excited about, I've studied grace all 
couple, last couple weeks, I've been so thankful, reminded of his mercy. And I realized that part of the problem, why we, we struggle with this is so much of our life is based on performance. From the time we're a little kid, if we clean our room and do what we're supposed to do, then mom and dad will give us a, you know, maybe an allowance or something, you know. If we, you know, go to school and if you get good grades, if you, if you work hard, then you'll get good grades. If you work hard at sports, then you'll get a trophy, maybe a scholarship, you know. All the parents said, please God, you know. Um, if you go to, if you work hard, then your performance is based and you'll get a, you'll get a promotion, you'll get, you know, you get a paycheck. And so we live in this world that is performance based and it is completely contradictory to the grace of God. Because the Bible says here, this is not by your works. This is not a reward for your good deeds. It is a gift for God, from God. And even all of us that know this, and we, we know this, we can still fall into the trap of working to earn God's approval. And the reason I can say that is because my whole life, I've known the truth of this, but I have struggled. To, I keep thinking I gotta do something to make God love me or somehow stay worthy of uh, being accepted by God. And I am reminded I can never, I can never be good enough. I can never earn this grace. I can never earn this kind of love, right? I was asking God this week, um, as I was thinking through the the stories of grace in the Bible, I started in, in Genesis and I went, man, right there at the beginning is a picture of God's grace. When Adam and Eve rebelled against God, man, God could have just, uh, he could have just killed them and says, let me start over. You know, let me, <laughs> it's only two people. Come on, let's, <laughs> let, let's just start over from scratch and figure this out. He could have, but he didn't. Uh, and then you read through the Bible, God was merciful to Abraham and Sarah. He showed grace to them. When Abraham lied, he showed grace. When, when he, he showed grace to Lot, who moved his family right in the middle of Sodom and Gomorrah, and God still showed grace to that man for all that wickedness. I wouldn't have shown grace to Lot. I would say, Lot, you got your Lot, man. That's what you got, right? <laughs> Not God, man. You you read through the Bible, you see God showing grace time after time for the Israelites getting out of Egypt and parting the Red Sea and getting across on dry ground. You see grace when they went into the promised land and God showed grace to a prostitute named Rahab and her entire family and she becomes a part of the lineage of the line of Jesus. Grace upon grace upon grace. Every chapter, every book shouts of God's grace and then you get to Jesus. What? I read the stories of Jesus and the, and the grace that he showed towards people that nobody else wanted to have anything to do with. Man. See, Jesus came to give us a very clear picture of God, of his nature and his heart, a picture of the Father. That's what he came to say. He said, if you see me, you've seen the Father. And that's why if you don't read this Bible, you won't know who God is. And you won't know what life God's got for you to live. You've got to get into this word and let this word get into you. Jesus came to show us who God is. He came to show us what love and, and grace really looks for. And so I got to this one story and my heart was arrested by the way Jesus pronounced grace over this person. It's a very familiar story. It's, uh, it's one that a lot of people have preached on, but I realized I've never preached on this passage of scripture I've studied it, I've read it, I've referenced it, but I've never preached on it. And it's from this passage in John chapter 8 where there's actually one of the most quoted phrases of Jesus. One of the most quoted sentences where he says, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. You've heard that? Even if you haven't come to church, you probably heard somebody say something like that, right? It's also one of the most misunderstood and misused quotes of Jesus. So if you have your Bibles, open them up to John chapter 8 and we're going to read just a few verses here at the beginning of John 8. And uh, let me set the stage for this. It's early in the morning and Jesus is at the temple in the outer courts where a crowd has gathered around and it says he is teaching the people once again. And while Jesus is teaching, there's a group of Pharisees and scribes or teachers of the law, Jewish leaders, political leaders, religious leaders, and they drag a woman in in front of Jesus and throw her down at the feet of Jesus for she had been caught in the act of adultery. And this is what they say to Jesus in, in verse four. Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery and the law of Moses says to stone her, what do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something that they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. 
They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up and said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone, or let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Then he stooped down again, and he wrote in the dust. And when the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. And then Jesus stood up again, and he said to the woman, woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said, not one. And Jesus said, neither do I. Say that last part with me out loud. Go and sin no more. Now, a couple things from this story immediately jumped out to me. First, you've got this group of Pharisees and teachers of the law quoting the scripture to Jesus, the one who wrote through the Spirit all the scripture, the one who is actually is the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. Hello, dwelt among us, uh, right? And they're like saying, well, do you not know that the scripture, I'm sure he wanted to go, hey, 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 I was there when it was written, guys. I am the word, I am here, right? So you've got these people quoting scripture to the scripture. And they are actually trying to trap Jesus. Did you notice that in verse six, it said they were trying to trap him because only the Romans could declare that someone needed to be put to death. So if he said, yes, go ahead and stone her, he would be in trouble with Rome and the law. But if he said, no, don't stone her, he would be ignoring the law that was handed down by God to Moses, to the people. So they were trying to trick Jesus. But Jesus himself has said, I have not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but I have actually come to fulfill the law and the prophets. He wasn't giving her a, a get out of jail free card. He wasn't giving her a pass. It wasn't like a loophole to the law where she could just get out and I'm not gonna condemn you, it's okay, wink, wink, you know, it's all right. That's not what he was doing. He was saying, you don't have to pay your penalty because I'm gonna pay it for you. Neither do I condemn you because I am taking upon myself your condemnation. I've come to fulfill the law. But the thing that, man, broke me when I was studying this this week was it says that Jesus stooped down. <sighs> he stooped, he stoops down to the ground. He gets, he gets on the same level. <laughs> the person that, that nobody in that group wanted to identify with, nobody wanted to associate with her and her sin, and what she did, nobody else, all the religious people are standing around and the son of God is stooping down. He stooped down because she couldn't get up. He stooped down because if she was ever gonna get up, somebody had to get down and help her get up and nobody else was there to help her get up. So he, he stooped down. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that, that grace stoops? Aren't you glad that Jesus, grace always comes down to the place that we are. It always meets us right where you are. Grace doesn't say, well, when you get your act together and get cleaned up enough, then I'll love you, then I'll accept you. No, no, no. God just says, I'll come to where you are. But I love you too much to let you stay there. I got, I got so much more life for you to live. But grace stoops. You need to thank Jesus. You know, when you think about what you're thankful for, when you think about the grace of God and, and the goodness in your life, I mean, you can thank God for the house you sleep in and the, and the food you had to eat and the car you drive. Those are good things to you know, be thankful for. But I want, you to, I want you to thank God that he stooped down for you. The grace stooped down for you, came down to our level. When we were caught in our sin, he stooped down from the glory of heaven. He humbled himself. He became poor so that we could become rich. He became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. He stooped, love stoops. In fact, the whole message of the gospel is that God so loved the world that he stooped down, that Jesus stepped out of heaven to a dusty little manger. He lived among us. He, he became one with us so that we could become one with him. Love stoops down. So he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. You know, there were two voices speaking that day in the temple courts. There were two voices that were speaking over this woman. There was the voice of the critics and the voice of Christ. The critics were condemning and convicting and Christ was confronting with compassion. 
He wasn't just saying it's no big deal. He was confronting with compassion. You know, this, this passage is a lot of time, it's, it's misused uh, to justify sin. You know, who are you to throw stones at me? You know, let him without sin cast the first stone. Leave me alone, get off my back, right? But if you stop there in the passage, you miss the most important part because these men were actually legally right. What this woman did was wrong. It was sin. She was guilty. Now, they weren't handling it right. They had wrong motives in the way they they handled it, but that doesn't take away from what she did. It was sin. Adultery is is wrong. It breaks trust in a relationship. It breaks down families. It it destroys people. It it, it brings heartache and shame, and God doesn't want any of that on, on any of us, right? So this woman was wrong. The men were legally right. But notice what Jesus said. He says, neither do I condemn you. Now, he wasn't saying, it's no big deal, honey. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying, oh, it's it's okay. okay." Everybody's doing it. You know, that's like old-fashioned Moses stuff. That's, you know, that's not today. That's not what he's saying here. Didn't try to justify it. Didn't try to rationalize it away and say, well, I know you had a rough upbringing. I understand you're in a marriage. Your husband doesn't really love you. He he wasn't doing any of that. He, He didn't condemn, but he also didn't compromise. So often the scripture has been used to compromise truth and call it grace or call it tolerance. But I don't want us to tolerate anything that keeps us away from God's best for our life in any area of our life. Jesus didn't come to compromise truth because the truth is what really sets you free because the truth is what really brings life into your soul. So he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. You know, he was the only person there that day that could have condemned her. He was was the only one that could condemn her and he didn't. He was the only person that was without sin and could have thrown judgment to her, but instead he gave her grace. Write this down if you're taking notes. Grace is getting what you need, not what you deserve. Grace is getting what you need, not what you deserve. Jesus shows her grace and then he says, go and sin no more. You can't keep living the way you're living. You can't keep living apart from God's best for your life. It was like he was saying, I could condemn you, but I don't want to condemn you because I want you to live the life that you don't even know that you could step into. But if you'll step out of the life you're in and step into the life I've got for you, God's, I've got a big life for you to live. So here's what I know. You can't be who you used to be and who you're going to be at the same time. You can't be who you used to be and who you're gonna be at the same time. You've gotta let go of the old life so you can step into the new life and step into everything that God wants you to have and wants you to experience in life. He won't condemn you. He says, neither do I condemn you, but he will correct you. I can tell firsthand, he corrects me a lot. Jesus doesn't condemn, but he does correct. He will speak to places in your life when you're reading the word because the word is Jesus. When you're reading the word, he will speak to places in your lives that don't line up with the word of God. And again, it won't be, it won't be condemnation, but it will be conviction. And by the way, conviction is not a bad thing, honey. Conviction is a good thing. Conviction is a beautiful thing. <laughs> conviction is God saying, I love you too much to let you keep walking down that path and building that destruction into your life. I love you too much to let you keep talking that way and gossiping about that person and doing that thing and hanging out. I I love you too much, I got too much for you, so I'm gonna convict you by my Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will let you know. You start to say something, he says, don't say that. Or you start to do something and he says, don't do that. That's the Holy Spirit. I don't, that's not, that's, you're getting off path here. Start saying something critical about somebody at work or somebody that votes differently than you or is part of a different group than you and you start being ugly about it, the Holy Spirit will convict you if you have ears to hear. Now, if you don't listen and you ignore the Holy Spirit, your heart will actually become hardened to him over time. And so when that has happened, you have to go back and go, God, I'm so sorry that I have just ignored what you've been trying to say to me. I wanna listen to you. I want your word to speak to me. See, God, the reason he said go and sin no more is because God hates sin. God hates sin. I don't have time to read all the scriptures I looked at this week about how much God hates sin. Now, he doesn't hate the sinner. In fact, Jesus in Matthew 11 is called the friend of sinners. He's a friend of sinners. How beautiful is that? But he hates sin because of what sin does to people. Sin destroys people. Sin destroys relationships. Sin breaks off our relationship 
between us and God. Sin messes people up. Sin lies to you. Just like it lied to Adam and Eve and said, hey, listen, if you do that thing, you're going to get what you want. It's going to satisfy you. It's going to feel good. It's going to be good. And then you get that thing and it leaves you empty and void and looking and longing for something else because sin is a big liar. So he says, go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. He shows her grace. Who was this woman? You know, we don't know that much about this woman. We don't know her name. We don't know if she lived in Jerusalem or if she was just passing through. We don't know um, if she was married or if the guy she was with was married and that's why it was adultery. We don't, we don't know anything. We don't know if she has kids. Does, we don't know how old she, we don't know anything. But who is this woman? Well, I, I, I'd like to propose that this woman is you. And it's me. We are this woman. We are the ones that have been caught in our sins and brought to the, the feet of Jesus because it says in Romans 3, 23 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have fallen short of, of God's standard and his righteousness. It says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin or what you get for sin is death, but the gift of God, that's, that's eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. We have been, we have been given so much. We have been forgiven of, of so much. When Ryan preached his sermon down at City Nights, uh, he, he gave an acrostic for the word grace. Uh, and it was, it, was, it was a beautiful acrostic. It said this, G stands for God's gift. And we've read many scriptures so far today that, you know, it's an undeserved gift from God. And when somebody gives you a gift, you don't go, oh, what do I owe you for this? Let me see what I got. No, no it's, a, it's a gift. It's a, you have to receive it. And that, that's R. It is received by faith. Ephesians 2, uh, we read scriptures here where it says it's not by works, but it's by grace. It's by faith. You don't earn it. A, it's for everybody. All, it's available to all is what that A stands for. It's available to everybody. You look at Romans 10, 13. I think I gave you this verse, Romans 10. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everybody. It's in, doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter how bad you've been. Doesn't matter what you did last night. Everybody can call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. See, it's costly. It's costly. It's free to us. It's a free gift, but it costs God everything. <laughs> it costs Jesus his life. That's why we don't treat grace casually or flippantly. And E, it's extended through us. And I just want to spend a few minutes on this one. It's extended through us. See, the way the grace of God is demonstrated to the world is when we, who have been loved much, love much. When we who have been forgiven of so much, when we show forgiveness, we've received grace and we give grace. You know what that does? That is a picture of God's grace to the world around us, to the people at your school and the people at your work and wait for it, the people in your home. Yeah, Sometimes the hardest people to show grace to because we just get so comfortable and casual and attitude and no, 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 we gotta, show, we gotta show grace because we've received so much grace and if we can't give it, then we don't really got it. If you, if you can't get over an offense of what somebody did to you and I know that there are some serious things that people have done to people within our church because I've sat and talked with many of you but if we can't get over an offense that I believe we are completely unaware of just how offensive we have been to God and how much we have been forgiven of because over and over and over and over and over through this Bible, especially in the New Testament, it says that we are to forgive the exact same way we have been forgiven. We are to forgive others the way we have been forgiven. Ephesians 4.32 says, forgive each other just as God forgave you. Colossians 3.13, forgive, say it with me, forgive as the Lord forgave you. So think about how the Lord forgave you. Completely. Completely. No strings attached. It wasn't like, well, gosh, I don't know. Ah, man, what well, you did, ah, maybe if you are good for like a week. And then, no, there were no strings attached. He didn't hold any grudge against you. He didn't get, when you messed up, and you go, oh, there they go again. Should have expected. No, he didn't, he doesn't do, he doesn't play those games with us. Man, he forgives freely. He forgives completely. He releases us. And he says, that's the way we're supposed to forgive others. Forgiveness is serious business to God. Serious to God. In fact, when you read 
Uh, the Lord's Prayer, which is found in two Gospels, Matthew chapter 6 and Luke 11. Uh, you know, there's the part in the Lord's Prayer where he says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Okay, so he gets done with the prayer. The only part of the prayer that he repeats, he doesn't repeat about doing God's will. He doesn't repeat anything about praying. He doesn't repeat anything about surrendering. The only part that he goes back and says, now let me make sure you heard what I said, is the part about forgiveness. Look what he says in Matthew 6, right after the Lord's Prayer, he says, for if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your heavenly Father will not forgive your sins. That's heavy stuff right there, guys. And I know... I know that it's, it's, it's much easier said than done. I get it because I've had some people that have hurt people in my family and I didn't want to forgive them. I kind of wanted to hold on to my, mm, against them because of what they did. They, des they didn't, I felt they didn't deserve, they didn't deserve it. They didn't deserve for me just to go forgiven, all done. But then I realized neither was I. I didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve to be released by God for the things I've done. And so God, you're gonna to have to help me forgive those people. You're gonna to have to love through me, the love that you've given me. You're just gonna, because I don't have it in me, you're just gonna to have to love them through me. The grace that you've shown me, it's just gonna to have to flow through me to them, Father. It's gonna to have to be supernatural because I can't do it in the natural. And do you know, he'll do that. If you actually invite him to do that by the spirit of God, he will do that in your life. But you have to invite him and you have to want it. And you have to say, the grace I've been given, I will show. Because it's one thing to get all excited about the grace of God. Oh, but God, woo, glory, glory to God. Amazing grace, how sweet this is. It's one thing to get all excited about it for yourself. It's another thing to show it to the people in your life that have hurt and offended you. At the end of this passage, of this story, um, Jesus goes on to say this. This is the last verse here. He says, after he says, go and sin no more, he, he turns back to the people as this incident just happened. And he said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you don't have to walk in darkness. There was a picture right in front of them of a, of a lady who had been walking in darkness, stumbling in life, trying to find her way, looking for something or someone dissatisfied. He says, listen, if you follow me, you don't have to stumble around in the darkness because you, say it with me, you will have the light that leads to life. Don't you want that today? Don't you want the light that leads to life in every part of your life? So how's the Holy Spirit been speaking to you? Some of you, the word for today is you need to let go of sin. You need to let go of sin. When, when he says here, go and sin no more, there was a sin that you've been holding on to that you need to let go of. You might be a Christian and have been following Jesus, but this sin has gotten a hold of you. Could be your mouth, could be the way you talk about people, could be your attitude towards somebody. It could be a bad habit or an addiction that you, you can't break on your own and you need, to, you need to get some help. You need to get somebody around you, some accountability to help you step out of the life that you're living and step into the life that God has for you. But you, your, your word is let go of sin. For some of you today, it's let go of the offense. Let go of the offense. When I talked about that person who has hurt or offended you, th their face came right to your mind. You know who they are. Do you know that's the Holy Spirit saying, child, let it go. I don't want to give you freedom. I want you to walk in freedom. I don't want you to be held back by that. You've got, to, you've got to freely give this amazing grace. They don't deserve it. It's a gift that you give them just like you receive from me. Let go of the offense. And some of you today, you've got to, like this woman, let go of your past and take hold of the promise. Let go of your past life. Take hold of the promise that Jesus was offering this woman today, that you can walk in the light that is the light of life. Jesus wants to help you. He wants to forgive you of your past, give you hope today and a hope for a future. That's what he wants to do. But you've got to let go of the past and grab hold of the promise. What's your response today to Jesus? I want us to stand at all of our campuses, and I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer. Campus teams, you can come and... Um, 
I want you to know, church, that I have been so excited to preach this word this weekend because I know that there are some people here today that are going to get set free, that the darkness is going to lift and you're gonna see the light of God and the truth of God and you're gonna make the decision today, man, I gotta, I gotta walk in that truth because that truth is for me. And I guarantee you, if you'll follow Jesus and embrace this grace, you will find the life that you've been looking for in every area of your life. Let's bow our heads as we pray together. God, I wanna thank you for your word. I thank you that it uh, reminds us of just how amazing your love is in our life. Thank you for loving us when we don't deserve it. We don't. Thank you for your kindness towards us, which is better than our own life. We just thank you for that today. Help us to always be amazed by grace. As we continue to pray, if you're here today and for some of you, you need to let go of a sin. You, there's a sin that you've been holding on to or justifying or ignoring in your life, just right where you are, make a personal between you and God, but say, God, I'm sorry for that sin. And then confess what that sin is to God. Just tell him, he already knows. For some of you today, uh, you need to let go of an offense. There's a hurt that you've been holding on to, and it is holding on to you and holding you back. And today is the day you're gonna let go of it. You're gonna release it in the name of Jesus. You're gonna forgive that person. You're gonna release them for their offense. You're gonna give the gift of forgiveness and you're gonna release them right now. Just say, I forgive. And then write, say that person's name. I forgive. God, let your grace flow through me. As we continue to pray some of you today, today what you need to do is you need to say, Jesus, come into my life. I need your grace to wash over me. Maybe you've been trying to earn his acceptance and earn his love. And let me tell you, friend, there's nothing that you can do to earn it. You just have to receive it. And you have to say, would you come into my life, Jesus? Would you forgive me of all my sin? And would you pick me up and pick me off the ground? He stooped down for you to pick you up and help you live today. And so I wanna pray this last prayer and I wanna pray it over you today. And if you would say, Todd, include me in this prayer, a prayer of, of a fresh start, a prayer of a, of a right relationship with God, a prayer of surrender of my life to God, right where you are, would you slip your hand up and say, Todd, that's me today. I need that new beginning. Yes, hold your hand up all over the room. Hold it up high. Yeah, don't be ashamed. Hold it up high. You need a new beginning. Don't be ashamed about it. You, you need God to do something new in your life. It's beautiful. Every head bowed in this room, but those of you with your hands up, would you just look at me for a minute? I just want to talk to you. Best decision you could ever make in your life. This gift of grace, you just say, God, I want everything you've got for me. I don't want to miss out on anything you've got for me. And so I would, I would count it a privilege to pray with you tonight. And so if you would just, I'm going to make my way right down here, and I'd love for you just to make your way right out. We're just going to pray real quick right down here. So just, you just pat the person next to you and say, you can come with me, or excuse me, I need to get down there, and, uh, and we'll pray together. So just make your way. Come on down. Let's pray. Come on, guys. Let's pray together. If you don't want to come alone, bring somebody with you. That's okay. Jesus wants to give you a new beginning, a fresh start today. Come on. You may say, well, what are they gonna think if I walk down there? We're gonna think you're making the best decision of your life today. New beginning, fresh start. Jesus loves you so much. He loves you so much. And so we're gonna pray this prayer and the Bible says that this is just a prayer of surrender to God, saying, Jesus, I want everything you have for me. Come on down, we're, we'll wait on you, come on down. I want everything you've got for me. We're not in any hurry. You, we, this is the most important part of this whole time together. You making this confession of your life. That's right. Jesus was the one who said, if you confess me before man, I will confess you before my father. How beautiful is that? So you're right by your, this step that you've made, and there's some more that need to come while we're saying this. By this step that you've made, you are confessing Jesus before all of us. You're saying, I want to turn my life over to him. Doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. You're not going to walk out of here and be Mother Teresa, right? But you're confessing Jesus. And Jesus said, I will confess you before the Father one day. He's going to say, yeah, yeah, he's mine. She's mine. Yeah, yeah, I got, they're mine. They're mine. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, he's got, so we're going to pray this prayer and it is your confession of faith in Jesus Christ. And we're all going to pray it with you together. 
but you guys prayed a little bit louder than the rest of them. Okay, let's pray this together. Say this, say, dear God, I need you in my life. Jesus, forgive me of all my sin. I am sorry. I repent and I follow your way. Thank you for your grace and for your love that has washed over my life. I want to follow you the best I know how for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Come on church, let's thank God for these that made this decision. Okay, team, you can come in. Um, don't leave just yet, our team wants to pray and I wanna give you something. We love you guys. Have a beautiful weekend, Jesus. We'll see you next weekend.